friends post graduates ladies and gentlemen welcome to post graduate endoscopy master class we have now a novel attempt to try to explain the various nightmare situations as a beginner you might encounter so here is what we call a meet the professor or ask the expert session i have given you various nightmare situation for a beginner being a diagnostic endoscopy sometime you get stuck during an endoscopy and also when you do a procedure not rightly you may en encounter perforation bleeding and also there are various complications one can have during therapeutic endoscopy trying to understand them all we have given a situation wherein a question will be asked to my, my trainee and i'll be giving the answer i'm sure you like this module and i look forward for your feedback let's go to the module Thank you, Professor. Thanks for joining me. I have quite a few doubts to ask you today. And uh, the other day, I had a lot of difficulty like one patient, even passing the oropharynx. And uh, I was putting the scope inside and the patient was keep on moving with his tongue and uh, it was going sideways. I was not able to see even the cricopharynx. What is the trick uh, you recommend to navigate via the oropharynx? Getting lost in oropharynx, that is a common problem I understand your difficulty. If you have an uncooperative patient or a patient with a big tongue or a tonsil, it could be a challenge for you. What I do in this situation, let me tell you. I first of all, I reassure the patient and if necessary, I will give him a conscious sedation, 1 or 2 milligram midazolam and I take the scope. I am very careful that I stay in the midline. You should not see any teeth on your passage. And you should ensure that, as you can see in the picture, the tongue is at 12 o'clock and also the soft palate and the uvula at 6 o'clock. You go further and you should see the, the glimpse of epiglottis. You should go just behind the epiglottis and you should dock at 15 centimeter. That is normally what we teach. And if you are having any difficulty, if the patient is keep on moving the tongue, what I normally do, like I am sure you will also agree with me is finger guided intubation that is with your non-dominant hand push the tongue further and you pass the endoscopy over that. I am sure you ensure the patient is having a mouth guard so that he will not bite your index finger, your pricey index finger. That is a trick that is what we call a direct intubation sometimes until you go into the curricular pharynx. Then after that everything under vision. So that is I hope this is useful to you. Last week I had one case of a patient with the plumber Vincent syndrome and uh, that patient when I did the endoscopy the scope went into the post record region and uh, I was just seeing what looked like a small slit but I couldn't go at it I didn't know what to do whether I would perforate so I was a bit hesitant can you give me a clue professor how to circumvent this problem. Getting stuck at cricopharynx yes that is a common problem. As you can see in this picture, uh, if you see, when I am in 15 centimeter, I should first recognize the vocal cord, arytenoid fold and the right and left pyriform fossa. The right pyriform fossa it at 3 o'clock and the left pyriform fossa at 9 o'clock in the monitor as you can see. But occasionally, especially when the patient is uh, coughing, sometimes you accidentally go into the trachea. How to recognize that you are already in the trachea? Either the patient is having severe V's are coughing or you will see the tracheal ring and also that going into bifurcation, trifurcation. In that case, immediately withdraw the scope and wait for a few minutes before you go again. So, that is a one important thing you should prevent happening that is accidental bronchoscopy. The next of course is I always find whenever you have a patient with a difficulty passing at cricopharynx, it could be one of the two or three reasons. It could be like a patient with a plumber vincent syndrome as your case said a post cricoid wave or even it could be a case of Zenker's diverticulum every time we will be entering into this blind pouch posteriorly or could be a post cricoid cancer. Even otherwise a patient with the severe cervical spondylosis can have a difficulty. So, that I ask the patient either himself or I will ask my staffs and bring the patient's head slightly flexed what I call a Japanese the uh, bow like bowing like a Japanese man. If you do that, that very often let me enter. If it is not, then I have a trick in my sleeve that is what I call a guide wire directed intubation. I am sure as a student and also as you, 
might have seen our anesthetic colleague they what they do is whenever they have a difficult intubation they pass a bougie over the bougie they pass the endotracheal tube similar way you have the guide or as you can see here in the picture and I pass the metallic plexi tip guide wire in the access channel and it will be dangling and you just pass the guide wire and if the guide wire goes in the post cricoid region very easily over that you just gently thread the scope that is a way to easily go and then you take the guide wire then you proceed that is the thing I think I am sure this tricks would be useful to cross these difficult cricopharynx. Thank you sir. Middle of this esophagus one day I was stuck and I had a lesion look like a tumor and uh, I wanted to go beyond to see the upper limit, lower limit and is there any other associated complication but I could not do. I do not know in those situations which is safer to come out, take a biopsy or try to go beyond by any other means. What is your suggestion sir? Stuck in the middle of the esophagus. Yes, I am sure if you have an obstructing pathology. See, if you have a patient with a, a tumor for example or a, even a corrosive strictures whenever we always see whether it is completely including the lumen, what is the upper limit, lower limit, how circumferential it is. But if it is so tight, if you are not able to go beyond, there are only two options. Either if you are a beginner, the safest thing to do is if you suspect malignancy is take a biopsy with the top end, then submit the patient for a CT scan or a barium swallow, come back in another day with the seniors, that is the safest thing to do. But if you are little experienced, if you want to just traverse this, what I would recommend is take a, again another flexi guide wire, pass it over that either you can use a savarigil or dilator not beyond number 10 because your scope is around 9.2 millimeter. So, 10 dilator then you take the dilator then you can go through the scope that is a option number 2. But as I said very important thing is if you forcefully dilate a stricture in a patient in an unprepared situation that is what you are inviting trouble as a perforation. So, you should be very very careful just I would do a biopsy and come out investigate then you decide what to do. I hope that is useful for you. Thank you sir and uh, this particular case um, we had last week and the patient was fasting for nearly 12 hours but in spite of that and when I did an endoscopy I could not see the lower esophageal sphincter I could go beyond around 30 centimeter I saw a lot of food and lot of fluid and I was keep sucking, I could not see the lower esophageal sphincter, I was thinking whether it is a case of a stricture or a calatia, I do not know and I had to call my seniors and uh, they did the job for me. In those situations, I am not able to find the lower esophageal sphincter and uh, what to do, can you give me some suggestion professor. Lower esophageal sphincter not in letting in, yes it can happen, to especially if you have a patient with a tumor right at the lower end of the esophagus or a calatia cardia as we all know with a fluid and food inside it will make a spastic lower esophageal sphincter very difficult to see. In this situations what I will do is go step by step if there is a fluid and food try to suck and try to empty because esophagus is normally in empty. If it is filled with the fluid or food it is pathology and you have to carefully see. And very many times a slight anticlockwise like anticlockwise if you turn the scope it will bring what is the lumen more or less at 10 o'clock position more to the center like this. And if you have a peptic stricture or a spastic lower esophageal sphincter again the flexis tip guide wire might come for a rescue you can pass the guide wire over that, over that you can thread the scope. And I often find the youngsters finding it difficult especially when you have a hiatus hernia with the severe gastric pundal mucosal prolapse that will make very difficult to go beyond that. So, as soon as if your scope tip is still in the esophagus patient will be keep on reaching. So, sooner you enter the stomach then you will avoid the mucosal prolapse. So, you have to find the lower esophageal sphincter and find one of these tricks and enter the stomach as soon as possible. This slight anticlockwise I am sure that will be very helpful because your navigation in the stomach is going to be always clockwise. This is the only anticlockwise turn you do before you go always to the right 
towards the pylorus. I hope that is useful. Thank you for that answer, Professor. And the, one of the common problem I had uh, in the last few cases, especially a patient with a gastric outlet obstruction is trying to find the pylorus. And whenever I go into the stomach with the fluid, I aspirate and uh, still I will be spending a lot of time in the fundus body region and not able to see the pylorus. It took sometimes 20 minutes, 30 minutes to find the pylorus. I am sure you may have some tips and tricks in the sleeves to share it with me to see how I can navigate a stomach which is very challenging. Getting lost in stomach, yes a roomy stomach, very easily anybody can get lost. What I will advise you is as soon as you enter the stomach, you should realize you are entering not the fundus but the body and you will see a puddle of fluid and if you go as you can see in the monitor if you go towards the 9 o'clock that means you are going towards the fundus what you need to go is either you dive in or go towards more towards the 3 o'clock position and you should take what I call a go along the long road that is along the greater curvature for that I would say this particular diagram I am sure you might have seen very useful you should see the Treat this monitor like a clock and uh, see what is on the 9 o'clock the anterior wall, 3 o'clock posterior wall, 6 o'clock the greater curve and 12 o'clock lesser curve. So, you need to go along the greater curve. In other words, you have to walk along the greater curve and you have to turn more to the right. So, for that you need to do a three important movements if you do as soon as you enter the stomach, suck the little fluid. And do these three movements. What are the three movements? The big wheel towards you, towards you that will look up. And then clockwise twist, clockwise twist of the shaft, in then you turn to the right. Then push once 5 centimeter, 5 centimeter, 5 centimeter. Then I am sure you will be reaching the pylorus. That is, the pylorus will be seeing, and you should see the pylorus end phase, like as if you are standing in front of me face to face then you will be easy to enter like this. That is the easy way to enter. So, that is the way I would say the easiest, surest way to reach. Otherwise, in a dilated stomach, roomy stomach, anybody can get lost. I am sure it will be of immense help if you follow this important advice. Thank you, sir. Next time, I will try to follow your advice. The other day, I was just at the pylorus, but I was not able to go into the duodenum. And every time I go in, it went into spastic. Oh, don't ask me. I had a lot of trouble, but uh, uh, what I can do in those situations? Pylorus not giving permission. Yes, uh, pylorus is normally very welcoming, especially when you go near it. End phase, as you can see, it should be open, like an open invitation. The door is open, then enter. If it is very shy pylorus or a spastic pylorus, you have to wait for the peristalsis to go or little installation of water or little mild encephalation, do not in over encephalate the stomach, then it will open up. Sometimes buscopan do help, but not necessary. I think patience is a virtue. If you are very patient, I am sure you can very easily enter. Sometimes unlike what this procedure like here picture says, uh, end facing pylorus, it is down facing like top picture or side facing like this here, then you will find it, you will be spending minutes even hours to spend. So, you try to orient, try to bring it the way you want, the pylorus at the center, then it will be easy to enter. Remember that I am sure for rest of your life, it will be easy and the pylorus will be always permitting you to enter. Sometimes I had a problem professor. From D1, I could not go into D2. I followed all your advice of big wheel towards me and a clockwise twist of the shaft, turning my body still. I was still in the D1. I do not know what I was not doing right. Can you give some suggestion where I am going wrong in those situations? Let us understand the duodenal bulb D1. The second part of duodenum D2 are two different worlds as you can see the picture a smooth featureless D1 the bulbar region and the valvulae conventus the horizontal mucosal folds with at 9 o'clock as the even this picture shows ampulla very classical sign. 
but going from D1 to D2 is not an easy task, especially for beginners you know the various parts you need to cross first bulb bar part, then post bulb bar part, then you should recognize one important anatomical area that is what I normally call the superior duodenal angle, then you enter the D2, then go to the end point ampulla. This five step process, how do we do that? I am sure these two pictures will explain to you. The picture here, as you can see here, in the when you go to the pylorus in the bulbar region, you go another centimeter post bulbar region, go where it takes a turn. There only, that is, you have to go and say hello to the superior duodenal angle, then only you need to do these following maneuvers that is, big wheel towards you, small wheel away from you or you give the right hand torque so that you turn right and also you have to turn your body itself you have to turn to the this way. So, you are no longer seeing the patient you are looking at the monitor. So, your body movement your hand movement to the right and also the wheel movements the big wheel all the three and the fourth one I would say equally important is pull back what was a long route you make it short route. So, these are the things as you can see this picture I am sure you might have seen this in the book also big wheel towards you, small wheel away from you or twist the shaft to the clockwise and turn to face the monitor and then you bring because this is the very important number the 60 that is from the incisor teeth the tip of the scope the length it was 90 centimeter before as you pull back it will be bang at 60 you will be saying hello to the ampulla that is the best way to dive into the T2. Thank you sir I think next time I should uh, follow your advice try to do all the movements you just enumerated after seeing the superior duodenal angle I know the now the trick. And uh, last week I had one patient and uh, who presented with a melina and I did an endoscopy I said uh, to my senior colleague that the endoscopy was normal I could not find a lesion, but he did a, a second look endoscopy next day he was showing me you missed a posterior duodenal ulcer I do not know how I managed to miss a posterior duodenal ulcer and uh, sorry for that, but I am sure there should be some reason can you just explain sir how carefully one has to look for a posterior duodenal or all this um, what I call a blind spots how to look for them any clues you can give me. Missing to see posterior duodenal ulcer, I am sure that is one of the mistakes normally done by the beginners. Because whenever we have a patient with a duodenal ulcer bleeding, especially in the posterior wall, sometimes you miss. Can you know see the difference between these two pictures? The picture number one, where posterior wall is not clearly seen, the right one you can see the posterior wall very well. How it is possible? There are only two things we can do. Either see, for example, if you are looking at the monitor and if you just turn to the left you see at the anterior wall that is at 9 o'clock. If I just turn this side that is more to the right I look at the 3 o'clock that is posterior wall. So, your body movement can make the difference. The second is a small wheel. If I just take the small wheel away from me then it turns to the right and withdraw the scope little bit then you will be able to see a posterior wall. So, you need to be very very because there is a very small space you should spend lot of time when you are withdrawing careful turn the right to the right by small wheel away or turn your body to the right these two things I am sure will make you just realize that you are able to understand the posterior duodenal ulcer and you will be able to see for example, 3 o'clock is a posterior duodenum and a 9 o'clock is anterior wall and you will be able to see a posterior ulcer anterior ulcer and anatomically you will be able to understand. So, I am sure this is a very very important question you asked and thank you for that. Thank you sir, I think next time whenever I come out from D2 to D1 I have to spend extra time to turn my body more to the right to look into the posterior wall not to miss the posterior duodenal ulcer because that I know now is one of the common reason for a torrential bleeding. Thank you for that and the next as you can see I had a problem last time one patient with a, a GA bleeding I did do a retroflexion, but there are a lot of blood in the fundus as you can see and I could not see. So, I have to say blood and fluid poor view repeat the endoscopy. So, what in these situations especially when we have not found a lesion to 
find any clues you can give how carefully examine the fundus especially in a patient with a GI bleeding or unprepared patient. Yes, retroflexion of endoscopy to look at the fundus is very very important. It has very typically as we see as soon as we come out of the duodenum what we do? We dock in the antrum. Then first thing is you just take the big wheel slightly towards you. What do you see? The picture first one showing you will see as if a ridge is appearing that is nothing but the incisura going from 8 o'clock to 2 o'clock and above it is a body below is the antrum and you bring the big wheel completely towards you so that you cannot move this big wheel anymore that is what we call a hockey stick like scope that is a J maneuver. Once you do that then here once again an anti clockwise turn or your body also turning your body movement and a scope movement clockwise anti clockwise and pulls a millimeter at a time then you will be able to see a panoramic view of that not only the body fundus and also the cardia and when you do that sometimes if the patient is having some fluid in the fundus or blood clot you may have to suck with a good irrigation or even you have to prop up the patient because left laterally if the patient is still lying you may miss a lesion. So, I would just bring a patient momentarily to 45 degree upright if possible then you do a procedure then you will be able to see a lesion maybe a large fundal varices or a small crust tumor in the cardia or a gist tumor with a bleeding all these things can be easily diagnosed provided you know how to retroflex carefully examine with a clear empty fundus. So, this is a very important trick I am sure you ask this question and this is the what you should practice not to miss a lesion in the fundus that is one of the beginners mistake. Thank you sir. The last problem I had two days ago I had one patient with the dysphagia I could not find a lesion then I sent the patient to the ENT and they said there is a small lesion in the vallicula and my professor was asking me you should have seen the cricopharynx and the vallicula carefully. I thought that can be examined in a flexible endoscopy by us. Can we identify lesion in the cricopharynx vallicula normally in a routine endoscopy sir what is your comment on that? Withdrawal you rightly said is as important than insertion. Whenever we withdraw especially the very important thing is whenever my both hands on the wheels for example, I have to teach my staffs like a cigar grip they will just grip the scope. So, that the scope is not vomited by the patient otherwise what will happen immediately the scope comes out you and you miss one 5 or 10 centimeter of esophagus or you have to carefully dock on your withdrawal carefully see like this picture what about whether the patient is having any vocal cord lesion, pyriform lesion or in front of the epiglottis you see what I in front of the epiglottis is vallicula is there any lesion in the vallicula all the tiny early lesions you should not and we should not leave it for the ENT specialist to make a diagnosis. Even I would to go one step further after the endoscopy put your finger carefully see the tonsillar region and the posterior wonder of the tongue sometimes oral examination with your digital examination is equally important because it is like rectal examination we do before colonoscopy here after endoscopy if you are not able to explain the patient's dysphagia or a foreign body sensation in the throat always do a digital examination. So, withdrawal is as important as insertion you are right and this is the way I do it that is cigar grip by the your assistant. I am sure all these tips you find it very useful take it for your rest of your life because every time from henceforth whenever you take the scope do what I call a cock withdrawal and all these tricks add it with the all the things you read in the book as a trip tips, tips and tricks for the navigation and whenever you have any trouble during diagnostic endoscopy I am sure either the books or your mentor or your seniors are there to help and it is you as a trainee I am sure with all these tips and tricks soon you will be a good trainer and good luck for that bye bye now. Thank you sir.